Here we go. Okay, thanks, Olivia. Um, so absolute pitch, I mean, we, we've talked about absolute pitch uh, in the past. Um, it, it's the ability to identify isolated musical tones. So if I play a tone for you, can you guess what that note is, right? Like middle C, um, right? And not just like having to think about <laughs> what the note is, but just immediately I play it, you tell me, you know, um, pretty accurate, pretty effortlessly. Um, so the question is, do people who speak a tonal language have absolute pitch? So it's kind of different from the question that I think Nayel uh, raised uh, last Tuesday um, uh, about whether if you're tone deaf, can you not pick up a tonal language? But this is the opposite end of that spectrum. If you speak a tonal language like Mandarin Chinese, um, are you, do you have absolute pitch, right? So uh, the research lab that has looked at this question is in UC San Diego, uh, Diana Doish. Um, she's actually uh, quite famous in language and music perception. Um, and they have shown that people who speak Mandarin and Vietnamese actually, you know, are more um, likely to show absolute pitch uh, than people like you and me who don't speak uh, tonal language. So here is an example um, of one of the studies that have you know, um, being looked at in Diana Deutsch's um, lab. This is called Sometimes Behave So Strangely. Um, open that up. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Who? Morning. morning. That's right. Would you all wait and say hello, Professor Deutsch? Hello, Professor Deutsch. Uh, Professor Deutsch, I just explained to this class what I think might happen by listening to the next example, but I haven't told them or we haven't, they haven't heard any example yet. So just to give you a little background as you're watching this uh, video or DVD, I'm, I'm going to try to make it into a DVD for her. Uh, they've never heard the example. I feel like I'm a magician. You've never met me before, have you? Yeah. You know? uh, so let's see if you can hear what I think you're going to hear, you guys. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely. They sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Try it. Sometimes behave so strangely. Go ahead. Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. So did you hear the melody? Yeah. yeah. So strange. Was she ever really singing though? No. no. So why do you think it happened? Has any of you heard this musical illusion before? Okay. Did you hear that as a melody? But there was no melody. Okay. Kelly, I know you're unmuted. You want to say something? I was just going to say that, yeah, I did hear that and it did sound like a melody. Right. So what do you think is happening? What do you think is happening over there? Why do we hear a melody when there's no melody? Um, because there's, um, well, there is tone and pitch involved in speaking language, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and so the variations in that, I would think they could make a melody. Sure. Da, 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 da. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely what it is, but but the person who um so the person who's reading it out is not saying da 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 da, da right? That person is not doing that, but it's your musical brain, musical perception that's doing that, right? So anybody else who thinks what's going on, who knows what's going on, Olivia? 
Um, I think also like our brains are, whether it's like a visual pattern or like an auditory pattern, we're always looking for stuff to help us remember more or like pay attention more. So I think because it was repeated, like the more it was repeated, the more it sounded like a melody, because that's kind of what naturally we're, we do anyways. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Good. Any other answers? I guess I've kind of had like the opposite of what she just said, where like I learned like the digits of pi and the periodic table with the song, but then I had to like teach myself it without the melody. So like I could remember how to like actually do it without going 3.141, you know? So right. like right. kind of like that. Uh huh. Yeah. Because it's easier to remember with the song, but then sure. you can take it out. Sure, sure. It's got to do with the sound, with the speed sounds, right? Sometimes behave so strangely. There's some kind of a sonority scale that's going on. Sonority in terms of, you know, is a sonorous sound, right? The sound quality of it. Um, so the question that I want you to think about is, if I change the words, would you still have the melody? Probably not. Right. So that's the connection between the language and music that we talk about. Right. So um, so even the children. Right. I mean, they had no clue that this was going to happen. But, you know, the more that they repeated it themselves, it, they all of them were kind of singing it in that tune. Right. Even if you were not a musical person or, you know, do not have absolute pitch and that kind of stuff. The other uh, kinds of studies that have looked at the relation between music and language is in terms of Gregorian and Hebrew chants. There's a lot of work that's been done um, looking at, you know, Gregorian and Hebrew chants. Um, people have analyzed their structures with respect to prosody, intonation, melody. Um, and, and what these studies have looked at or, or shown is that the nature of chanting in contrast to the singing is the reason why it should be considered a form of heightened speech melody rather than musical melody. So, um, you know, we, I told you last uh, class that when we get into poetry, we're getting into that area of language that intersects with music, but chanting is another area, you know, which is I think more, um, uh, you know, closer uh, to music than even poetry. Um, but, you know, people have shown that it is still speech melody and not musical melody. So those are some of the studies that I've looked at. Um, similar to speech disorders in the brain, there are also musical disorders, right? And an example of a musical disorder is amusia. So very similar to aphasia, amusia. Whenever you have the A in front of a speech disorder, it means that thing does not exist, right? So amusia is actually musical tone deafness, right? Uh, so, it, you know, I think this relates to um, Nayel um, talking about tone deafness. Um, so, you know, I told you treat tone deafness with skepticism because unless you have been diagnosed with amusia, you probably can, you know, identify tones. Uh, but obviously if you're in a music, like, you know, if you're in a basic, um, then you obviously have issues with identifying uh, tones. So it's a cognitive deficit in the perception of pitch contours and musical tones. So people have also looked at uh, studies done on uh, musics, um, and these studies actually show deficits in linguistic intonation and uh, perception. Um, so, you know, again, I'm not going to go into the details of these studies. I'm just trying to kind of give you an idea of what people do. Uh, with respect to language and music and their research labs. Um, all these studies, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of giving you the overall um, kind of hypothesis and generalization that comes from these studies, but these are all still ongoing studies, right? So you can still do an experiment and maybe find different results from, you know, what these research labs have uh, found. So in my own research lab, I'm really interested in the question of language and music. Um, like I said, I've been doing psycholinguistic experiments for the last five years with language and music. Um, my lab is actually interested in whether there are shared representations between language and music. Uh, what do I mean by shared representations? You know, when you 
when you talk about syntax and language, you're literally building up representations in your brain, right? And these are abstract representations, you know, um, like tree structures, right? Of those of you who have done 315 with me. Um, it, are those representations shared in the brain with music? Those are the kind of things that we have tested in my lab. So, you know, um, these are some of the questions that we have asked, um, you know, if there's an abstract representation, uh, could that be shared? You know, maybe language has a different representation and music, you know, has a little bit more linear representation. Um, but what about like creating a structure of music in your brain? Can that kind of influence the structure of language, right? So, you know, uh, is there abstract representation or exact representation? Uh, what we have done is we have done psycholinguistic experiments with, you know, many, many, many participants. Uh, we do this in, uh, uh, in a room in the library because we want it to be soundproofed um, so that there's no distraction. Um, we give participants language tasks and music tasks, and we ask them to do some stuff. So, uh, you know, one, one example of a music task is basically, we ask them to listen to a musical piece that we have created, right? We have manipulated using the circle of fifths. Those of you who know music will know what that is. Um, and we ask them after they listen to the music piece to complete something in language, either produce something in language or comprehend something in language. And then we see if there's interference between the two. And the answer seems to be yes. Um, you know, um, there seems to be some connection and similarity between representations in the brain for language and music. So that's exciting. But obviously this is still, you know, we are very much on the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more work to be done. If any of you are interested, you know, we can talk more about this. So that's really what I have to say about language and music, um, you know, it, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in this area. And I know a lot of you are interested in language and music. So uh, if you are thinking of a capstone project or a senior on a thesis or something like that uh, for, for the applied linguistics major, this is actually a really great, you know, area uh, that, you know, um, that it's a personal favorite of mine. Um, so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. All right. Um, there are some musical illusions. I'm not going to get into these in the interest of time because I know Kelly is waiting um, to, you know, um, talk to us about sign language, but I will put these here so that you can look at it at home. Okay, so just really quickly, so this is kind of where we are ending this class. Uh, obviously, this is a hundred level class. It's only a nature of language class. Uh, there's a lot that can still, you know, um, be talked about with respect to any of these uh, kind of bullet points. Uh, but there are obviously other courses at Wichita State that does this. So if you are interested in doing um, or learning more about the subdivisions of linguistics, take um, English Linguistics 315 with me next semester. Um, it's a class that really fills up quickly. So you want to get on it if you are really interested in doing that, uh, especially if you're in the major, you have to do it. So, you know, I highly recommend um, those of you uh, who haven't taken 315 to take 315 next semester. Um, and if you're interested in majoring in linguistics or minoring in linguistics, um, the new undergraduate catalog has the updated curriculum. Um, but my website also has information. Uh, the English department website also has information, but I'm always happy to talk to you about linguistics. Um, you know, so if you can make an appointment to talk to me about majoring or minoring in linguistics, I'll be happy to do that. I just wanted to kind of quickly give you an overview of what you can do with linguistics, but that's something that, you know, children often ask me, like, what can you do with a degree in linguistics? Um, so there are many different options depending on what track you're in. If you're in the speech pathology track in applied linguistics, obviously a speech language pathologist or an audiologist is a great choice. I've had students in the past um, who have done speech pathology as their major, a minor in linguistics, have gone on to a PhD in you know, speech pathology or linguistics with a speech pathology concentration. Um, so that's really a great option. You'll obviously also need to get licenses um, like your CCP, you know, CCCSLP uh, license. So um, th there are additional requirements um, you know, to that. Uh, forensic linguistics is a great option. 
Um, you know, we have in the criminal justice department um, here at Wichita State, they do a lot of forensic science. Um, so if you're interested in going that route, you can do linguistics with um, elective in forensic science from criminal justice. That's a really great option. Uh, a lot of my friends who didn't end up getting into academia uh, have jobs in Google or Amazon or Apple. Um, both in uh, America as well as in India, literally just across the world. Um, Google really, really loves linguists, uh, especially for ad jobs, because, you know, all these creepy ads that pop up, right, when you're listening to these YouTube uh, videos, that's literally a linguist working together with a computer scientist. So um, that's a great career. Very well paying, if you may ask me, right? Better paying than a professor position. Um, speech recognition. We are really at the horizon of, you know, um, speech uh, language processing, speech language recognition, you know, uh, bots like Alexa, uh, Google Home, um, you know, um, Apple Siri. Um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to get it to the stage where we feel that we have made progress with you know where we want to be um, and that's really another area in which if you do the uh, the track in computational linguistics uh, in the applied linguistics major you're definitely going to get like a job in you know um, one of these uh, big uh, companies um, they really value that kind of computational linguistics uh, data skill set uh, that you come with. Cryptologist, uh, you know, um, is, is another option. Um, so is being an interpreter, working in the FBI, especially if you know another language, uh, because they're always looking for, um, you know, people who speak Arabic or, um, you know, any of those kind of languages, like the Middle Eastern kind of languages. Um, that's really popular. Uh, educator, you know, a professor like me, um, it, that that's always a, an option, but especially if you do like a advanced degree, like a PhD um, or a master's uh, in linguistics and then go on to do a PhD. So these are some of the options that you have uh, with linguistics. Any questions on career options or anything that we talked about today? All right, so just as a quick reminder, we will meet in person next Tuesday in Lindquist Hall 324. Okay, we are not meeting on Zoom, so um, come to class at 9.30. I look forward to seeing all of you there. All yours, Kelly. Let me make you the co-host as well. So that, all right. You are muted. Thank you. Sure. I am going to share my screen. Okay, and can everyone see that? All right, so I have been an interpreter for 22 years now. <clears throat> I started and thank you. I started in 2000 um, and I worked for the public school system here in Wichita until 2018. And during that time, I also worked as a um, video relay interpreter for a video relay company that deaf people use to make phone calls. Um, and during that time, I also did some contract interpreting with Wichita State University in the evenings. And then um, I've done some community work interpreting as well. <clears throat> and I've been working for Wichita State University since 2018 as a full-time employee. Um, so I kind of just put a PowerPoint together to show some of the, the linguistic properties of ASL. So we will start with the sign parameters. So every sign in American Sign Language has five parameters. And uh, the first one is the hand shape. Um, so the hand there, I, the next slide, I have a chart that shows all of the hand shapes. There are several different hand shapes that could be used. Orientation, which means your palm orientation. So whether 
the palm is facing out or sideways or backwards or down location. And so that means where the sinus produced, is it produced on this part of the face, on the head, over here in your sign space, that's location. And then movement, of course, is the type of movement that that particular hand shape is going to make. And then there are non-manual markers. And there are so many non-manual markers. Um, and I have a slide that will talk about that a little more in depth. So kind of the basic rule is if any of these parameters change, then it will alter the meaning of the sign and the sign will become a different sign. <clears throat> Um, this is real fuzzy. I couldn't find a real clear picture, but um, these are all the various hand shapes that we use in American Sign Language. Um, this is not the alphabet, um, although the alphabet does use these um, hand shapes, but um, these are just all the hand, hand shapes that make up the signs. Um, so I'll show you some examples of parameter changes. If we're talking about the sign deaf, it's we're using the one hand shape. And so it's kind of like a, a closed fist with your index finger pointing up. And um, you put it on the side of your cheek up here, and then you move it down here to your chin. So deaf. Now, if you were to take this hand shape and change it into a D hand shape, which means the fist part opens up to become almost like a circular form right there. That's a D. And then if instead of using the index on your cheek, if you use the tip of the circular spot and but the movement and the location is the same, it's a different word now, it means dorm. Another example would be school. So school, you're using flat hand shapes and for school, you're just tapping it twice, school. But if you wanna say nice, you are going to change the movement and you're just going to move the top hand out. So school, nice. And so we see how those minor little parameter changes really make a big impact on meaning. So you also have nice and then to clean. So you're moving it, the movement, um, you're going in the same direction. You have all the other parameters that are the same. It's just the movement is now becoming repetitive. And so that changes it. Mother is with the open five hand shape. You place it on your chin, but for father, the location changes, but everything else stays the same um, and it changes the whole meaning. So parameters are really important parts of the language. <clears throat> so the basic structure of ASL is object, subject, verb. So if you have the sentence in English, the boy is going to the store, in ASL, you're going to produce that as store, boy, go. And that looks like store, boy, go. Um, and this next example I really like because if you don't follow the correct structure, um, it, it will actually make it seem as if the elephant is sitting on the boy instead of the boy is sitting on the elephant because of the visual nature of it. So um, the, the boy sits on the elephant. So you're gonna start with the elephant. And typically in ASL, you start with a larger item. So you have elephant, and then we use a classifier it's a like a bent V, I don't know if you can see that. It's a bent V and you put it there that's kind of representational of the animal. And then you say boy, and then you put the boy sitting on top of the elephant. Um, and so if you did it the other way, it would be boy, elephants, and you would have the elephant sitting on top of the boy, which would not work. <clears throat> and so that's kind of the reason why the structure is object first, subject second. Um, we have temporal markers in ASL and they are free morphemes. They occur at the beginning of the phrase and then also they are sometimes 
added as a repetition at the end of the phrase. So an example would be last night, hi, I devour. Um, so the last night's first. And then the second sentence, will go to the movie, will, or you could even say movie, will go, will. But there's all, sometimes there's that repetition of the temporal marker at the beginning and at the end. So for descriptors um, and adjectives, they, are, they always follow the noun. So an example would be last night, pie, and then you would specify the type. So key lime, and then the I is implied devour or store big boy with the brown hair, he will go. So um, you see the hair that's brown comes after the boy to describe the boy. And then big is after the store to describe the store. <clears throat> For pronouns, they use a system called pronominalization and it's all indexing. So that makes all the pronouns non-gendered um, because they all look the same. They're all using an index. And the reason for this is because typically you've already set up your objects in space. And so then when you reference them, you just index to where you've placed them in space. Um, so there's not a need to add um, a gender because you've already somewhat established that. Um, so for he, like in the English sentence, tomorrow he will go to the store, it's tomorrow, store, and then you point to wherever, and maybe I've set them up here, maybe I've set them up here, wherever I've set them up in my space, I'm going to point to that to indicate he. <clears throat> For plurality, you can indicate that in two different ways. You can either use a free morpheme. So an example would be backyard tree many, um, many being the, the plural word there, or backyard tree three, you could specify it with a number. Um, another way to show plurality is reduplication. So if you have several trees in your backyard. You could say backyard, tree, tree, tree. And that all obviously indicates more than one. <clears throat> um, for affixations, um, there are suffixes, suffixes in ASL, in particular when you are taking a noun and changing it to an agent noun. So cook, and then for chef, we sign cook, but we add this at the end, which is the agent suffix. Um, so that means a cook person or a chef in English. Um, song, and then musician, you would sign song and add the agent sign for run, and then if you add the agent sign, it becomes runner. Um, also, there's a, a type of infixation, um, like when you're using directional verbs, the me, you is always implied in some of these verbs. Not all of the verbs are directional, but some of them are. So like um, give, this is give. So if I'm going to give you, I would give you or if you're going to give me, it would just come back towards me. So you can make that directional depending on um, the meaning. Um, also number incorporation. So if you want to say the three of us in ASL, you would use the hand shape for three, but you would put it palm up and you would circle it like this. And this is kind of similar to the sign that we use for we or us, which uses an index. And it starts here and it comes around and it's kind of like saying me and you and you and you and you and me. 
So we or us, but then you add the three within that same movement and place location and it becomes the three of us. Um, another way that number is incorporated, well, another example of that same type of incorporation would be when you're speaking about weeks. So the sign for week is a flat palm and then you have the index that goes across. It's almost like you're going across a calendar. You know how um, a calendar is horizontal for a week. It's kind of that same idea, it's a week. But if you wanna say two weeks, then you just add the two sign to that same sign or three weeks or four weeks. Um, you can also do this with months. So this is month and it's kind of like you're going down the whole calendar. So month, but if you want two months, you can say two months or three months or four months. Um, you also see this when you're talking about age. So this is the sign for age. And then if you wanna say one year old, you just, you sign the sign for age, but with a one hand shaped. So one year old, two year old, three year old, four year old, and so on. And so that is um, a type of infixation. We also have nouns that are derived from verbs. So an example would be the sign for sit, which you're using um, a U hand shape, palm down for both, and one of them is, like, is placed on the other. So that's sit. But if you wanna change that to the noun, you tap it twice and that becomes chair. Another example is eat. So you have this, it's a flat O hand shape going to your mouth. You do that once for eat, twice for food. Um, to fly in an airplane specifically, you have one movement like this. This is the I love you hand, but it also represents an airplane. So it moves forward and that's just one movement. But if you're speaking about the airplane itself and you wanna make that a noun, then you just do it twice, airplane. Now we'll talk about multiple meaning signs. And these can cause, uh, these are different words that are signed the same way. And so really the only way to know which particular meaning the producer um, is trying to convey is to know the context. You have to know the context of the entire conversation. So <clears throat> print um, on your flat palm and you use your thumb and your finger and you just kind of push it together. That's print. And then you can also use that for newspaper. So like if you're talking about print on a paper, you know, print newspaper. Um, appreciate is like this but also enjoy is like that. And so it heavily depends on context there. We also have um, lexicon that has multiple signs dependent on the meaning. So an example is the English word run. Now in English, there are so many different meanings for this one particular word, even more than what I've put on the, the slide. You can physically run, like running with your legs, right? You can um, like run a machine, which would mean to operate a machine. You can um, <clears throat> run for office which means you're in a competition to win the office. So to run would mean to compete. Um, you can have a run in your pantyhose or a sweater, and that means like a rip or a tear. Um, your nose can run, which means, you know, to drip. And then water can run. So in English, all of those meanings, it's just the same word without any spelling difference. 
But in ASL, it's so meaning based and concept based that each of those signs are going to be different. So we have run like this for physically running. We have this kind of run for operate. This is to compete. So that's run for compete. And then we have a tear or a rip, which would be a run in a pantyhose. Your nose runs like this. This, this classifier typically represents um, you know, liquid moving out. So if it's running from your nose, you'd put it there. If it's water running, then <clears throat> wherever you have set up your, your spigot or your faucet or whatever, then it would, it would run from that. Um, another example would be the color blue. So if you're, or the word blue, if, if you're meaning the color blue, then you're going to sign blue like this. However, if you mean that you're feeling blue or feeling down or feeling sad, you're gonna sign it like this. So as you can see, they're all totally separate signs. <clears throat> okay. Let me see if I can move this. It's kind of getting in my way. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So now we'll talk about the non-manual markers. So <clears throat> non-manual markers all hold grammatical information and they're very, very important in ASL. Um, these are actually some of the more challenging parts of the language that speakers, it's difficult for speakers to really pick these up and become comfortable using them because they are so different than what we're used to. <clears throat> so we have mouth morphemes, that's one category under non-manual markers. The first one would be, um, it says cha, but you don't really verbally say that, you just make that mouth shape when you're signing certain things. And it's representative of something that's thick or really big. So when I'm signing big, um, I'm not gonna mouth the word, the English word big on my lips. I'm actually going to go Or um, if I have uh, like a book that's really thick, I might show the thickness and say like that. Um, another one would be pursed lips and that represents something that's small or thin. Um, so if I have like a, a magazine that's really thin, I'm going to sign thin. Well, this is like a classifier to show the thinness but I'm also going to use my mouth morpheme and go. Um, puckered lips would mean medium average. And so that's like, like that. The next one is a fun one. And it's always, everyone always laughs when they first learn this. And some people have a hard time moving their tongue like that. But if you're gonna say something far away, while you're signing that, you're going, I don't know if you could see my tongue do it. Was it clear? Like that. So that's kind of a funny one. Um, <clears throat> if you have something that's like covered or full of something or um, like a large quantity of something that's big. So like if you have a crowd of people um, you're going to show them like this, but you're going to go, or, you know, something, let's say I've set up to where my palm represents some item and it's covered in, I don't know, glitter. I could go like that. Um, and then you have the TH and that kind of is representative of something that's happening slowly or carelessly or clumsy. So even um, if I'm signing the sign that's like clumsy, I'll be like, like that. 
or you could show a person, this is a classifier of a person walking, maybe they're walking clumsily. So I could be like, Um, so there are, that's a lot of information and you can imagine if you're not incorporating that, how much information will be missing from what you're trying to get across to someone. Another ma non-manual marker is body shifting. So in sign language, we use body shifting to show role shifting within a dialogue. Um, so in English, we use a lot of he said to her, or she said to him, in ASL, we don't do that. We don't specify with all of those words because we just show it. So we set up, if you have two people having a conversation, you set, let's say mom on the right, child on the left. So anytime a child says something, I don't say, and the child said, I literally just turn, I roll shift, into and I become that child and my eye gaze might look up and I say whatever it is and then I turn and I now I'm mom and I respond and so it cuts out all that he said she said type of language that's happening um although it is it's very much implied still so it's not like that information is lost you can also use body shifting to compare and contrast different items um, so I'm going to set up two things in my space and I'm going to compare those two things. And when I'm speaking about this one, my body shifts over here. When I'm speaking about this one, my body shifts over here. And so sometimes if you do it appropriately, you don't even have to sign like the, the lexical feature of, um, you know, the word different or opposite or contrast, you can literally just show that it's all implied within the body shifting if it's done appropriately. Eye gaze is another non-manual marker. And I kind of talked about that with the, the body shifting with the mom and the child. Um, so when you're having dialogue like that, um, eye gaze is important. Um, so the mom would look down at the child, the child would look up at the mom. Um, also, eye gaze is used for transitional markers. I went to a workshop where they videotaped a deaf person telling a story. And it was probably like a five minute story. And then they slowed it down into extremely slow motion so we could analyze every second of what was going on and every movement and every little subtle thing. And it showed that eye gaze um, is used for transitional markers. So, you know, you're saying something and then you notice a little eye shift and it would usually go down and like kind of to a slant. And then the next utterance would start. <clears throat> when they're doing it at full speed, regular speed, if you're really not honed in, you might just totally miss that little piece. Um, but it's there. So that was really interesting. Also, there are head nods that are used. These can be used for affirmation of a concept. They can also be used as transition markers. Um, so for affirmation, it would be like, if I signed will, this is will, and I had my head shaking yes, that's just affirming, yes, I will do that. Um, a head shake can be used to negate. So if I sign something that's like, um, you know, it could just be a neutral phrase, but if I shake my head, no, then that obviously negates what I'm putting out there with my hands and with my actual signs. Um, and then we have eyebrows. <laughs> So eyebrows are also non-manuals. And for WH questions, when you're signing those, you furrow your eyebrows. It might be hard with my glasses. So you just put your eyebrows down like this. Um, where? Or when is that event? Or when did that happen? Eyebrows always down. Um, for rhetorical questions, I get my glasses back. Your eyebrows 
are going to be raised. And they're also raised for yes, no questions. So um, my eyebrows are up. Did you like the pie? Did you like the movie? My eyebrows are up. Um, also, we have topic indicators. So when you first um, start a sentence, you, you raise your eyebrow for the topic part. It's kind of like a subject predicate type of um, division within the language. So, and we always start with the object. So like to use the example that we had before with the elephant and the boy, I would sign, I would lean forward slightly, raise my eyebrows up and sign elephant. Then I would go back into my neutral stage, eyebrows are neutral, and I would say, boy, sit. So the boy sat on the elephant. So the eyebrows are really important in ASL too. All these little subtleties that so many people just really don't ever realize that are involved within um, American Sign Language. But this is why we can say that it's an actual full language because of all of these facets of the language. Um, I've also included some tools for learning ASL if anyone is interested in doing that. There, is, um, there are two apps that I really like. One's called Pocket Sign and the other is the ASL app. And I think both of these have, um, like you can get basic information for free, but then if you want to like further your learning, then you have to pay, I think, a fee to continue on. Um, but they're really good apps. And then the ASL classes that Wichita State University offers, they use Signing Naturally curriculum, which I used this back when I was, um, way back when I was learning sign language in college. I learned through these books as well, and they have made updates along the way, but really they're very popular. This is the curriculum I think that really a lot of universities use. It's a really good curriculum. And then also if you want to really, um, as I say, geek out on the linguistics of ASL, which I love to do, there is a book, Linguistics of American Sign Language by Clayton Valley and Seal Lucas. Um, and I also have one if anyone would ever want to borrow it. Um, and then let me show you a real quick, quick, um, yeah, we have time. This is um, a YouTube channel. And the man that has this channel is called Bill Vickers. He's a deaf man and he teaches ASL. I believe he teaches at a university somewhere, but I forget uh, what university but he has a whole, a whole channel and I'm subscribed to that. And he is one of the best, he sets up, the way he sets everything up is just phenomenal. So let's see, we'll do this one. Just so you get a little Grammarly glimpse. does more than catch errors. Kelly, With uh, Grammarly, you can to, find really- Sorry, can you, yeah. So you have to stop share and then reshare your browser. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. If I can get my, oh, here, stop share. Um, and so this, I like how he does it because he has a little screen in the middle of the two participants that has the English on it. And then he is teaching the other participant signs. So it makes it really clear and easy to learn, I think.
So it's um, it's obviously all silent because it's all in sign language, but um, it's really a, a great tool if you want to learn. And let me find my, there's one other thing I was gonna share, I think. <clears throat> Oh yeah, this is fun. Okay, let me see. <laughs> hmm. Oh, there you are. Sorry, I had too many screens up and I... Okay, the one I'm going to show you next is for practicing finger spelling. Finger spelling is always very difficult too when you're learning ASL. Um, and so this is a really good way to practice. Can everyone see this? Okay. Um, so first of all, you see it says maximum number of letters. So if you're just wanting to do basic, you could click three. And then you, below that, you can set your speed. So if you're beginning, you can set it to slow. So let's watch this one. I'll replay it. So that was OFF. So then you would type OFF. And it tells you that you did a good job. And so this is really good for receptive because um, receptive is one of the hardest skills in ASL. Um, but I do want to show you deaf speed of finger spelling. <laughs> Let's try a new word. Let me try a, a six letter word. See how fast that is? So interpreters use this a lot because obviously when we interpret, we have to be able to recognize there's a lot of finger spelling in the ASL. And so we have to be able to recognize that pretty quickly. But Okay, um, that was everything that I have. Does anyone have any question about ASL or even interpreting? Since I'm gonna drop off the call, I have to say thank you so much, Kelly. I mean, that was yeah. so enlightening. You know, I've never taken an ASL class before. I know quite a bit about ASL because I'm a linguist, but you know, I've never actually done, like, you know, how you showed me all these different, Thing. So that was really nice. What my question to you is, how difficult was it to start interpreting? Like, you know, you said 22 years ago, you started interpreting, right? Versus now that you have so much practice and so much experience, you know, was it difficult at the beginning? How difficult was it? Especially if you are interpreting for a technical talk, you know? Yeah. Um in the beginning, it was very difficult. I mean, I can remember my practicum. <laughs> it was so hard. Um, and you're almost like you have this feeling of um, such high nervousness whenever you meet another deaf adult, because you're like, oh my God, am I going to be able to understand what they're saying to me? And, you know, you're like, I can you, you usually feel somewhat confident in your production, sure. but really it's the most of the most of the nerves come from the um, receptive part, being able to read it because um, also everyone has their own style right. of signing and um, kind of their own dialect, especially like when I worked on the video phone, I would interpret calls from all over the country. And so, you know, in certain regions, they use regional signs that are all different from each other. And so all of those different regional signs and dialects and style differences make it very, very difficult. And um, interpreters go on a journey where, you know, I mean, just like probably any other profession where you, it's diff really difficult at the beginning, but you have to really it's a field where you never stop learning because language is forever evolving and ASL evolves. I mean, just last night I was hanging out with some of my deaf friends and I learned 
a new sign. So um, you never quit learning. That element never stops. And you always have to push yourself. If you ever get to a place where you come become complacent, then you probably shouldn't continue interpreting. Um, but it, it, it's easier now, but it's still very complicated and challenging still, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. Yeah. Thank you for everything that you do, Kelly. I mean, you know, it's a very noble profession, you know, um, I know, um, you know, America has had a huge tradition of trying to tell deaf children that they should still learn language and not learn ASL, you know, so right. we come from a very, I think, difficult history as well. So, you know, what you do is really, it's, it's really challenging, but I think it's also really rewarding, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and thank you so much. I'm gonna drop off the call, uh, but you know, thank continue you. asking Kelly questions. All right, I'll see you all on Tuesday. Bye. <laughs>